And now, please join us as Pastor Paul Gottlieb brings us today's message. Amen, amen. Good morning, Bethel Church. How's everybody doing today? I get the privilege today of sharing God's word with you. And uh, I love when I get the opportunity to share God's word. And we've been in a series for the last several weeks around here called I Am. Jesus in the present tense, I am. Jesus is always present tense in our lives. He's always in our lives. Jesus is never referred to in the Bible as the great I was or the great I will be. He is the great I am right now interacting in our lives. Jesus wants to be in our lives. Jesus is and always will be present tense in, in all that we do. Jesus is, he, he isn't just a memory from the past. And he's more than just a promise for the future. Jesus is right now. Jesus is right here. He is. He is the I am. Jesus, who he was, he will always be. And who he will be, he already is. I'll let you just sit on that on the way home. You can think about it a little bit more. He is. Jesus is. It says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that good to know? That, that what Jesus did in the past and who he was in the past, he will be for us in the future. And, and what he was in the future and what he was in the past, he is right now for us. He doesn't change. He is. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the great I am. I am God's one and only son. I am the one who can save you, Jesus. I am the one who loves you, the one who forgives you. I am Jesus. Who are you? I am. <laughs> what a great answer to that question. I always think about this when you say, Jesus, who are you? And the response is, I am. Well, I am what? Jesus, I think, would say, I am exactly what I need you to be right when you need me to be it. I am exactly what you need me to be. He is the great I am. And the great I am is always greater than the great I need. In this life, we need things. Of course, we need life. Jesus says, I am life. In this life, we need peace. Jesus says, I am peace. Sometimes we need a miracle. And Jesus says, I am the miracle that you need. I need money. Jesus says, I am the provision. I am. I am right now what you need me to be. Right when you need me to be it. I am. I am, as we've been learning in the last few weeks, is a complete title for who Jesus is. I am is the full name. Anything that Jesus says after he says I am, anything that comes after that, that's just to help you and I. That's to help us understand his divine nature and it helps us to understand a different part of who he is. But I am is what Jesus is. He is the great I am. The truth is I am really is the only correct way to express God's timeless and limitless nature. Jesus Simply is. The past, the present, the future, they all unite under this statement when Jesus says, I am. Now, the thing that I love about when Jesus says, I am, is when Jesus says, I am, it's not just revealing something about him. It also reveals something about us. When Jesus says, I am, it also reveals truth about who we are supposed to be. For example, week one in this series, we learned that Jesus, he said, I am the light of the world. Well, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that also means then we are the people who never have to walk in darkness, praise God. In week two, we learned that Jesus said, I am the door. That also means that you and I then are the people who never have to act like we don't have access to God. We can come freely to the Lord because Jesus is the door. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That means that we are the people who should never go hungry. We should never be unsatisfied. In week number four, we learned that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. That means we should never feel like we are unprotected or, or not provided for. The shepherd is looking after the sheep. Last week, Pastor Brett taught a great message when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. That means that we become people who should never fear the sting of death because of who he is, I understand who I am. He is 
we are. Because Jesus said, I am, we understand more, not just of who he is, but who we are supposed to be. And I want to encourage you, if you missed one of these messages over the last couple of weeks, or you're just getting caught up here today for the first time maybe, I want you to go back and listen to those. You can listen to them online. We always have last week's sermon out here on the table. It's a CD. It's a free gift for you. Pick it up. Make sure you get it because this is a powerful truth when Jesus says, I am. Now today we're going to look at another I am statement from Jesus. It's found in John chapter 15. If you would, open your Bibles with me. John chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, we have one in the pew or in, the, in, in front there. Um, we're going to be on page 746. 746, John chapter 15. And you can just leave it open. A lot of the verses we're going to read today are found in John 15. In verse 1 of John 15, Jesus starts off by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5, Jesus says it again. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Once again, we hear Jesus make an amazing I am statement. This statement is going to reveal who he is, but then it also reveals who the Father is and who we are. Did you notice that? In this order, as we, re as we read this passage of Scripture, Jesus declares who he is and who the Father is before he says who we are. He says, I am the vine, my Father is the gardener, you are the branches. We were created in the image of God. You can never really understand who you're supposed to be until you first understand who God is. We know who God is, and because we know who God is, then we can understand who we are. We never really understand our purpose. We never really understand our identity if we don't first know who the Lord is and who God is in our life. Once you realize, though, who Jesus is, and once you realize who God is in your life, it's amazing how different you'll think. It's amazing how different you'll act. It's like finding out that your dad is the most powerful, awesome, wealthiest man alive. When you find out who your father is, you might just act a little different. You might just think a little different. You might realize who God is. And when you realize who God is, it brings revelation to who you are and who I am. God is the gardener, Jesus, the true vine. You are the branches. Jesus said, I am. He is. And you are. I am the vine. And because I've told this to you, you also know who God is and you know who you're supposed to be. And so I want to talk about that today. Let's look at this for a moment. Let's talk about the power of the vine. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Jesus is the true vine, the truth. He is true. When he says he's true, it means he is genuine. It means he's not false. He's not counterfeit. He is the only one that is true. He is the true. When something is true, it's been tested. You say, you know, and when something is true, you know it's been proven. When something's true, it's guaranteed. Jesus says, I am the true vine. I have been proven. I have been tested. I am the one and only. 1 John 5 Verse 20 says this in the New Living Translation. It says, and we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. He is the one true God. If Jesus is the true vine, that tells me that there must also be false vines, things that are not true, vines that look like they're true, but they're not, things that pretend to be legit, 
things that pretend to be the real deal. But when you get close enough to them and you actually look at them, you realize they're not true, they're counterfeit. Have you ever found something in your life that was counterfeit? Have you ever, have you ever seen something that wasn't real? When I worked at a skating rink uh, in Sacramento, we used to every now and then we'd see a counterfeit $20 bill. Looked kind of the same until you really looked at it. And then it wasn't quite right. It didn't feel right, you know. <laughs> the president's head was on backwards or something. I was like, this is off. This isn't right. I remember when I went on my first missions trip in high school, we went down to Ensenada, Mexico with our youth group. And I got down there, and I'll never forget the first day because it was a shopping day and we just had to, we got to have some fun. And I got downtown there, Ensenada, Mexico, and I got so excited because I saw all kinds of things that I wanted. Nike shoes, Oakley sunglasses, I saw t-shirts, and they were so cheap. I couldn't afford this stuff back here in, in California, but down there was like $7 for brand new Oakley glasses, and I was just happy. So I bought Nikes, and I bought glasses. I bought all kinds of stuff. I was pumped. The next day, I put my Nike shoes on. I'll never forget it. I put my Nike shoes on, and it was like the E fell off. <laughs> it was like this shoe said Nike, and this one was like Nick, you know, and I'm like, what? This is not right. And I remember we started walking, and we're walking, and I'm feeling good with my new <laughs> sunglasses on. And, and, and I'll never forget, I heard a pop, and my whole right shoe just exploded. It just broke. And I just looked at it, and my youth pastor came to me and goes, you know those aren't real Nikes, right? And I said, I do now. I do now. <laughs> I had no idea. I just thought it was really cheap, you know, I was feeling good. I didn't know. I paid the price. I bought them. But they weren't the real thing. And they could not last under the pressure. They couldn't hold the weight. That's what happens with the counterfeit. It looks good. It really doesn't last. And there's a lot of things in this world that are counterfeit. Things that we can, we can look for, but they're not true. They're not Jesus. The, you know, things that we look for in this life like success and money, our careers, relationships, on and on. We can go. All those things are good, but they're not the one true. Lord. They're not the one true vine. And as Christians, we cannot afford to attach ourselves to the counterfeit. There is no substitute for Jesus. Things that are true always will stand in opposition of things that are false. That's why that Jesus, he says, I am the one true vine. He always opposes the things in our lives that are false. When we embrace things that are not true, Jesus says, they only will lead to death. I am the one true vine. Look at what John 14, 6 says. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You know what that tells me? That life and direction for life can only come from the one who is true. Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the true vine. But not only is Jesus true. But Jesus is the source of life for the branches. The vine is the source. The vine is the source for the branches. It is what provides the life. Jesus is the true vine, and Jesus is the source. John 15, verse 6, it says, If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Branches wither because there's no life, because they're dying. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. When you are not attached to the source, when your life is not attached to Jesus, it withers and it dies. When your marriage is not attached to the source, when your, when your career is not attached to the source, it's very hard in this life to produce life when you're not attached to the source of life. The vine is the permanent support that allows growth, that allows life to even exist to the branches. The vine supplies all the nutrients and the water. And, and the vine, it, it shoots up and the branches shoot out. But remember, the vine also has roots that go down deep. You know, God works in ways that we can't see. The roots are underneath. And we don't always see what God is doing down underneath. We don't always see what Jesus is doing underneath. But those roots are going and they're providing water and they're providing strength and nutrients and the sunlight. Everything the branches need. Jesus says, I am the vine and without me you can do nothing. I'm the source. Jesus is the source. Look at 1 Corinthians 8 with me. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6. 
But we know that there is only one God, the Father who created everything. He created everything. He's the source. And we live for him and there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom God made everything and through whom we have been given life. Jesus is the source of life. John 10.10, one of my favorite verses that I memorized as a young man. John 10.10 says, the thief comes, does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I like that part. Not just life, but life more abundantly. More abundantly, it says. That word abundant in the Greek is a great word. It means this. This is what this word means. To be superior in quantity and quality. Abundant life. To be superior in quality and quantity. Jesus says, I give life, but I don't just give life like the way the world gives life. I give life. It is superior. It is better. The, the life that the Lord gives is so much better than the life anything else gives. Matter of fact, nothing gives life. Jesus is the source of life. It's superior. It also means to have an advantage. There's an advantage when you serve Jesus. It means a necessary abundance. I don't even, I, I don't even know how to begin to comprehend that. That God says, I give abundant life. It's a necessary abundance. You need life, Jesus is the source. You need love, Jesus is the source. I am whatever you need me to be, right when you need me to be it. The thief comes and he wants to steal. I come, I want to give life. John 1 verse 2, it says, He, meaning Jesus, existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word, Jesus, gave life to everything. Another translation says, in him was all life. Jesus is the true vine and Jesus is the source. He is the life to the branches. Another thing we see about Jesus in this passage of scripture is that Jesus enables the branches to be fruitful. Jesus is the one that enables the branch to be fruitful. That's the ultimate purpose of the vine, to produce Look at what it says again in verse 4 and 5. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear fruit. Much fruit, it says. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's interesting. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how smart you become. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. It, it is impossible for your life to produce anything godly apart from Jesus. I think about how frustrating that must be for people who are trying to live life without Jesus. Trying to, to succeed without Jesus, trying to produce, trying to produce, trying to have something fruitful in their life, something healthy, something living, trying to do things and you're not in Christ. Apart from Christ, you cannot produce anything. Apart from Christ, it is impossible. How frustrating to try to make your marriage work when it's not in Christ. How frustrating it must be to try to raise your kids when you're not in Christ. How, how frustrating it must be to live every day and you don't have the source, you don't have the life, you don't have Jesus, the one who enables us to produce. In our own strength, it never works. Matthew 19, 26 reminds us that with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. What we cannot do, Jesus, the one true vine, enables us to do. Imagine if you had a fruit tree in your backyard. You got an apple tree, lemon tree, you know. Cut the branch off. Throw it on the ground. Let it sit there for a while. How much fruit do you think is going to be produced out of it? None. We know that. Because apart from the vine, once it's detached, it cannot produce. And that's how it is with Jesus. He wants to enable us 
He wants to give us the strength. Jesus wants to produce godly fruit in your life. He wants you to produce something that lasts beyond you. He wants to, to, to enable you to produce freedom and victory. Jesus is saying here in John 15, he's saying, I am true, I am the source, and I will help you produce what you can never produce in your own strength. I am the vine. Now, just as quickly as Jesus says, I am the vine, we see another side of this. He says, my father is the gardener. Let's talk about the provision of the gardener. The provision of the gardener. Verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. Wow, what a great promise from God. I think sometimes people read this and it might almost seem like a scary Bible verse. He cuts, he cuts, yeah. But, but, but think about this. He cuts for a purpose. There's a purpose behind it. God is the gardener. The gardener always loves the garden. It's the gardener that planted every seed. It's the gardener that knows Every, every bush, every plant, God is the gardener. It's the gardener that waters the ground and, and he looks after and he takes care of. What a great promise from Jesus that God is looking down and he's taking care of and he's watching and he's pruning and making sure that our life is healthy and producing. God isn't trying to destroy the life of the garden. He's trying to make it beautiful. What a great thought that if God's doing something in our lives, he's doing it to help us and to, to make it produce. God is the gardener. The gardener will protect and provide. That's the job of the gardener. God says, that's my responsibility. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you because I am involved in your life right now. I am present tense. I am looking after you. Jesus is my one and only son. He's the one true vine. And when you remain in him, you're part of my family. And I will provide and I will protect. God says that's my responsibility, not yours. You know, just as a side note here, it's good to know that God's the one that does the pruning, not you. <laughs> not me. I'm so thankful that it's not my neighbor that does the pruning. I think sometimes we forget this, that God prunes. He knows exactly what the plant needs, exactly what the branches need. Let God do the pruning. Don't try to help him on that part. God's not trying to destroy the plant. He's perfecting it. Another thing we see with the gardener is that the garden will purge and prune. That is part of it. He will purge the branches. He will prune the branches. There are times where things need to be cut back and cut out of our lives. There are times where things just have to, to get cut because it's maybe grown unhealthy. I, I, uh, my wife and I have lived in a house for two years now. We love the backyard at this house where we're at because of the garden in the backyard. It's just beautiful, beautiful situation. Uh, flowers and bushes and trees. As a matter of fact, um, it kind of creates this natural barrier between us and all of our neighbors. You just go out there and the kids play. It's gorgeous. And our landlord came over a few months ago and she just looked and she goes, oh man, this is really overgrown. And the fence was kind of falling down and pushing over and all the wires up here were, you know, the trees had kind of grown through it. She goes, we got to cut this back. And so they had the gardeners come in and for two days they just chopped and chopped and chopped. And we went outside the next day and I went, oh, and it was so ugly. It was so like barren, all the, 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 the green and the flower, everything was gone. And I could see into all of my neighbor's backyards. It was like, oh, hi, you know, and now we, it was just, oh. And that was a few months ago. But now, it's amazing how much growth has come. It's healthier. You can see it. Things are blossoming more. There's more roses and there's more, you know, just, just the, the, the trees are healthy and they're strong. You can see that when you prune back, it's to provide health and life. And that's what God says. This verse where God says, I will cut, it's a warning and it's a promise. It's not enough to, to just look like you belong to Jesus. At some point, our life needs to actually produce the fruit that comes from living 
for Jesus. And if there are things in our life that are not producing, God says, I've got to cut that out. That's not producing life. I've got to get rid of that. That's not producing life. This is producing, but I need it to produce more, and I'm going to trim back. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, there were some stuff in my life God had to cut out. There were some old habits that God had to cut out. I was saved. I loved the Lord, but there were some old things that needed to go. There were some old friends that needed to go. There was some music that needed to go. There were things and stuff in my life that God said, i got to cut that out. That's not going to produce life. God is a good gardener. And he'll cut off anything that does not help produce life. And his desire is to help us stay healthy and strong. Now, we get to the part about us, the branches. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. You and I are the branches. So the purpose of the branches, we see this in John 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The first thing that we see about you and about me, about us, is we are to remain in Jesus. Before we ever get to the point of producing fruit, we are to remain. We are to stay in Christ. Remain in me and I will remain in you. To remain, to have relationship with the Lord. Every day we're talking with him. We're walking with him. We are in Christ, we are remaining in Jesus. Our life was never designed to be apart from the Lord. We were created to stay in constant fellowship with God. The only way this life really works is when we stay in relationship with Jesus. We can never really fulfill our purpose if we don't first remain in Him. That's why it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. See, everything we do here, church, our lives, Every day, it always comes back to relationship. This is not about religion. This is about relationship. Are you in Christ? Do you know him? Does he know you? Do you remain in him? If you remain in him, God says, I will remain in you. That word remain is awesome. It actually means to dwell in, to be set firmly, to be fixed, to be fixed. I am set firmly in Christ. I am fixed in Christ. I remain in him. 1 John 2.28 says this. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Those who do not remain in him find shame. Now, the Bible says, if you remain. That's interesting, if you remain. You know what that tells me? That tells me that you and I have a choice. It's not automatic. It's not just something that once you get saved, you just remain in him and you just serve him. If you remain, it says, if we abide. Look at some of these verses with me in John chapter 15. Verse 5, it says, if a man remains in me. Verse 6, it says, if anyone does not remain in me. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Verse 10, if you obey my commandments. That's a lot of ifs. That tells me that no one else can do it for you but you. You have to make the choice. Will you remain? Will you serve the Lord? Will you obey God? The choice is always ours. God gives us a choice and he says, if you choose right, you will be blessed. If you remain in me, I will bless you and I will remain in you. But the choice is yours. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 always reminds me. That we have a choice. We have a choice. It says this, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you'll make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if, if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you obey the Lord, if you love the Lord, if you remain, if you stay committed, you will live. The choice is ours. The question then today is this, how do we know? If we're remaining in him, 
if we are to remain in him, how do we know? Well, I think the next point in this, this verse shows us if we remain in him, we will produce. We will produce fruit, it says in verse 5. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. It, it's not what we feel. It's what we produce that reveals if we're really in Jesus. Sometimes people come to church and go, oh, I just feel God. And that's great. I love when you feel God in a room. I love when you're worshiping and you feel God. But it's not what we feel. It's what we produce with our lives that really shows if we're living for the Lord. You know, as Christians, we have to remember this, that it's not enough to just stop doing bad things. At some point, we actually have to start producing good things. It's not enough to just say, well, I'm not doing this anymore. Well, I'm not doing that anymore. You know what? Praise God. <laughs> Thank the Lord you're not doing that anymore. I am so thankful there are things in my past I'm not doing anymore. But if I'm really in Christ, it's not just enough to say, look what I'm not doing. I have to say, look what God is really producing. Look what's happening because I'm living for the Lord. What will you produce? I think the Bible makes it clear in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. It's the fruit of the Spirit. If we are one with the Spirit, we'll produce the fruit of the Spirit. Look what it says in Galatians 5, 22. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love. How many people want love in their life? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, the value of the branch is in the production of the fruit. If it's not producing, it's not value. And, and God says, I want you to produce I want these things to be in your life, good things, and I'm going to help you. The branch is to produce. Another thing we see is this, the branch is to bring glory to God. When you and I live our lives the way we should live, we will bring glory to God. It says in verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. One translation says this brings great glory to my Father. It's not so we can just say, look what I've done, look what I'm doing. Look, what, look at what my life is producing. When we live the way we should, when we remain in Christ, when we produce godly fruit in our lives, it brings glory to God. It says that God will be glorified by our lives. I don't know about you, but when I breathe my last breath and I stand before God, I want my life to have brought glory to him. I know none of us are perfect. We're never going to live perfect lives. But I want God to look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I know there were areas I could have done better, but, but I want my life to bring glory to the Lord. I want the way I love my wife. I want the way I raise my children. I want the way I act as a pastor. I want my life to bring glory to God. And the Bible tells us here that if we remain in Christ and if we really stay connected to the one true vine, this will bring glory to God. Number four is this. I think when a branch is doing what it's supposed to do, one of the purposes is this, that we will continue growing and producing. Verse 2, it says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will bear even more or be even more fruitful. The goal in this is never to just stay where you're at. Keep growing. Keep maturing. Keep learning. Keep moving forward with the Lord. To keep producing more and more and more. I started studying the nature of vines this week. I was looking into this as I was thinking of, on, on today's message. It's amazing how aggressive vines are. It's amazing the nature of vines. Matter of fact, they call them aggressive plants or climbing plants. They're very, they just, they continue to grow. They continue to spread. They're always moving out. They consume. They take over. They attach themselves. I watched this. It's amazing. They'll spin. You look this up. You'll see it. The, the, the vines, they begin to spin. They just spin like this and they spin and they spin and they spin until they touch something. And as soon as they touch something, they begin to wrap and they begin to grow until finally they've taken over everything. They're, they're, they're aggressive and they're growing and they're always moving forward. And Jesus said, that's you. I want you moving forward. The kingdom of God's moving forward. 
I want you growing. I want you moving. I want when you touch someone else's life, I want them to get consumed with the love of the Lord. When, when you are out in public or you're out at work, your coworkers, your friends, your family members, when you touch their life, there should be something godly from you that's transferring to them. You are the branches. Keep growing, keep producing, keep expanding. Ephesians 4.15 says it this way. It says, we will grow in every way more and more like Christ. That is the purpose of the branch. That is the purpose for you and me to keep growing more and more until you look like Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, are you starting to look like Christ? <laughs> the last thing today is this. The promise of the word. The power of the vine, the provision of the gardener, the purpose of the branches, you and I, and the promise of the word. God's word always gives a promise. Whenever you read and it says, if you do this, there's always a promise that if you do, if we obey, then this will happen. Let me read John chapter 15, verse 10 and 11 as we get ready to close. It says, when you obey my commandments... You remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Verse 11, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. What an unbelievable promise from God's word. That if we will remain in him, if we will allow Jesus to be the source of our life, if we will allow God, the gardener, to prune, if we will remain in him, not only will we be blessed, but our life will be saturated with love, overflowing with joy. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener and you are the branches. Remain in me because apart from me, you can do nothing. But when you stay in me, watch the life that I will bless you with. Amen. What a great promise from the great I am today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we pray. Father, thank you for today and this word that you've given us. Jesus, you are the great I am. And Lord, when we're in need, you're always there, present in our lives right now, ready to help. Not just someday, but right now. Thank you, Father, that you are in our lives helping us to stay healthy and to grow. That you're the gardener protecting and looking after watching out for us, helping us. Lord, I pray today that we would never detach ourselves from your love and your mercy, that we would remain in you and we would remain in your words and we would remain in your love, that we would never settle for the counterfeit things that this world has to offer, but that, God, we would stay in the abundant life that you have given us. And if you're here today, and maybe you've never really committed your life to the Lord. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. Maybe you're here today and you've never really surrendered. You've never said yes. I want to tell you, there is life and there is love and there is mercy and forgiveness found in Jesus. And today, he's here waiting for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you want life today, maybe you've walked away from the Lord and you know you need to come back. I want to lead you in a prayer right now where you're sitting with every head bowed, every eye closed, right where you're at. Just pray these, these words with me. Say, dear Jesus, I need you today. In my life, would you come into my heart? Would you come into my life? Consume me. Forgive me. Help me. Give me a fresh start. Today I surrender everything. I want to live for you. I want to remain in you and to have the abundant life that you promised. Thank you for dying on the cross so I can live in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. God bless you. Wow, amen.